Now may the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. Amen. That passage in Hebrews, you know, sometimes when you're reading the Bible, certain things just stand out to you anew. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Sometimes it just hits you in a different way. Well, today on this Mother's Day, we are closing off our series um, on uh, Lessons from the Garden with a, a message that quite honestly has been stirring in my heart since the beginning. Um, and I find it very appropriate for this Mother's Day. Remember where we started with the lesson, namely that uh, Jesus taught us himself that it's the Father's design and desire that you and I would bear fruit. And not just every once in a while bear fruit, but he, he specifically said bear much fruit. That this is to my Father's glory, that this is so that your joy would be filled. This is a great, very great promise that uh, Jesus reveals, a great, very great design that he reveals. He, he says to us that life is more than something to survive, but it's something given to us to make something of, to create good and life and beauty all around us, and specifically to spread the good news that in God there is mercy and forgiveness and healing and restoration, that all of this God has made possible through Jesus himself. This is actually God's vision for humanity, that we would bear fruit in this way as we're rooted in the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of his spirit. So if this is true, let me ask you a question. If we are truly designed for fruitfulness, if this is God's great plan for your life and for mine, um, what do you think would seem to you to be the greatest tool to produce the greatest amount of fruit? Anyone dare to throw back a response? What would be the greatest tool? There are no wrong answers. I do have one answer that I'm going for. But... Fertilizer. I like it. Water. I like it. Sunshine, light. I like it. All of them good answers. Some of them more smelly than others, but all of them good. I would argue that the greatest tool to produce the greatest amount of fruitfulness is actually time. The best gardeners and farmers know that the greatest yields of fruit from any particular plant are produced across the span of time. You can't just judge the fruitfulness of a tree by what it produced this season. It's, you, you can judge its fruitfulness over how much it produces over the span of its entire life. There are certain types of, I'm sorry if I'm boring you with all these little gardening facts, but I'm just very fascinated by them. And I think they're good illustrations. There are certain types of nut pine trees that'll take 20, more, 20 or more years to begin bearing fruit. Nuts that are edible, that have nutrition in them. It'll take 20 years. Now that would seem like a waste of time if you were planting that tree in order to harvest the nuts from it because you wanted the nutrients from it. It would seem like a waste of time until you realize that this tree would continue to yield a harvest for more than 400 years. It's ridiculous that a, that a tree would be, bear that much fruit. So could in that first 20 years, could you judge that tree by its fruitfulness? Really? No, you'd have to wait for a couple hundred years. Uh, ben Falk, he's this farmer I've been mentioning uh, from Vermont. He makes the point that a chestnut, and I'm, this is a direct quote from him, a chestnut can outyield a cow in terms of nutrients without needing any food to be provided for it, but it takes a decade or so for it to begin bearing fruit, whereas a cow starts bearing more quickly. He makes the point to saying the best things usually require a weight. But you know what? We don't like to wait. We tend, especially in our Western culture, and I think uh, that our American culture plays a big role in that. I, I, living overseas for nine years, I could see the influence of American culture, even in 
the span of my nine years there, we tend to have a drive and a passion to get things done. But we also have a drive and a passion to not want to wait for it. We like to get it done now. That's we, we are entrepreneurial. We, we are known as entrepreneurs, generally speaking, across the world. But the, uh, the reverse side of that is we don't like to wait for things to happen often. We don't tend to think long anymore. We tend to think short. We don't judge things in terms of their fruitfulness or effectiveness over generations unless it serves us in some capacity today. To us, the future seems uncertain. Change comes so quickly that we feel there's little we can do to prepare for it or even invest in it. So our focus no longer exceeds our own lifetimes or even reaches out across decades. Let's be honest, the last 14 months specifically have not been very inspiring for our thinking in the long term. Crisis tends to focus us on our present moment and this present generation of humans that walk the planet. But if there is a future beyond our present situation, uh, or, but what if there is a future beyond our present set situation? What if there's a greater vision to capture our hearts? What if the greatest impact of our lives is not limited by our graves? What if we started planting trees? There's this uh, wonderful story that Mark Bat- Batterson writes in a book called The Circle Maker. It's another one I, uh, I uh, recommend. I've already put it up on the website. Uh, he tells the following story. And these are his words. On the Swedish island of v- Visingso, there is a mysterious forest of oak trees. It's mysterious because oak trees aren't indigenous to the island and its origin was unknown for more than a century. Then in 1980, the Swedish Navy received a letter from the forestry department reporting that their requested ship lumber was ready. The Navy didn't even know it had ordered any lumber. After little historical research, it was discovered that in 1829, the Swedish parliament, recognizing that it takes oak trees 150 years to mature and anticipating a shortage of lumber at the turn of the 21st century, ordered that 20,000 oak trees be planted on the Singso and protected for the Navy. Now, by 1980, they weren't making boats out of wood anymore. But the lesson is clear, I think. They were busy with planting trees. I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings uh, chapter 20. It's a story about a king uh, named Hezekiah. Uh, Hezekiah was, I think, 25, 24. It says it right here. Let me just check that. We'll just say he's 25. He's 25, and for 14, 15 years, he reigned as king of Judah, the, 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 uh, the to, uh, part of the people of God, of the Jewish people. Uh, about 14, 15 years into his reign, he fell deathly ill, and he pleaded with the Lord to heal him. Now, you'll see in the, those first 14, 15 years of Hezekiah, this was a pattern for him. It, his reign wasn't always easy, but anytime he encountered some kind of struggle, he would fall to his knees and pray to God, God, deliver me from this. God, save me from this. God, this can't be good for me or your people. And God would turn the situation around in quite incredible ways. The same thing happened when he became deathly ill. It was a terminal uh, sickness that he had. And God sends the prophet Isaiah. We have uh, a whole book from the prophet Isaiah in the Bible. Isaiah comes to King Hezekiah and says, the Lord's heard your prayers. He's giving you 15 more years. Now, this was an incredible moment, first of all, to know how many years you're going to have left on the earth. How nice would that be? Uh, But just a second chance. See, in the latter part of his first 15 years, Hezekiah had become very prideful, had started doing things and being a little bit showy uh, in, in the way he was king, taking lots of the glory for himself. One would hope, I would hope, as I read this second chance that Hezekiah gets, that this newfound humility would come. You know, he's had this, he's had this life-death experience that it would shake him up. The very next thing he did was uh, horribly prideful. And a king or envoy comes from Babylon, and he takes 
this king of a foreign country in and shows him everything in the house, how great and awesome he is. And reveal this is not something you should do, being wise with a potential enemy nation. But he was so full of pride in his heart, he showed uh, he was very boastful about all the, how the great kingship that he had, the possessions he had acquired. Isaiah comes back to him and says, what have you done? Hezekiah tells him exactly what he did because he was so proud of what he did. And Isaiah says, uh-uh, this is not the kingship that God has designed for you. He says to him, in verse uh, 16, he starts uh, proclaiming these things that are going to happen. He says that his own house, it, that all of Israel is going to uh, be uh, come into ruin. That this foreign nation, the ones, the very nation that he had shown into all of the treasuries and all of the great wealth of the nation, that very nation was going to come and plunder uh, them. That was the nation of Babylon. Um, he tells this prideful king that judgment was coming, that his sons and his grandsons would see catastrophe, and that some would even be carried off into exile, that the nation which he was, of which he was king would be overpowered and all its treasures taken by a foreign king. How did Hezekiah respond? Verse 19, Hezekiah says, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, for he thought, Will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? Why no plea for mercy now, Hezekiah? All these times before when disaster was coming and it seemed like there was no getting out of it, you pleaded and God changed the situation. Why no plea for mercy now? Why no concern for the coming generations? Hezekiah had lost any sense of responsibility or vision for those who would come after him. This is further evidence in the life of his son, his son born in that second 15 years of his reign after his second chance. Uh, he did not train up his son, it, give any thought or attention, it seems, to his son and in teaching him the ways of God, teaching him what it meant to be a king of God's people. His son Manasseh became, who was arguably, someone who was arguably the worst king God's people had ever seen. Hezekiah lived out his days, and in particular, his final years, in a pursuit of a great life for himself, in his own words, for peace and security in his lifetime. Esther, however, are you familiar with the story of Esther in the Bible? Esther did not concern herself with peace and security in her lifetime. She was born Jew, Jewish. They were, the country was now in exile. The Jewish people were now in exile, many of them living in Persia. And she became queen to the king of Persia. While she was queen, a plot was uncovered to wipe out the Jewish people from the face of the earth. Esther was in the court of the king, though, and they didn't know she was Jewish. By all means, she was safe. Peace and security for her lifetime were secured, all but guaranteed. But she was inspired and even captured by a greater vision, one that was bigger than her own life. She would risk her own peace and security, her very life even, to save her people, both today and for generations to come. And once she had set her mind to do it, her only comment was this to her fellow uh, Jewish people, pray for me, fast for me. I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. One of these two people is the example of investing your life in today's peace and security. The other is an example of investing in the coming generations. Only one is an example of what we would call planting trees. So my message to you this morning is pretty simple and straightforward. And Mother's Day offers us the perfect opportunity to reflect on this. For mothers reflect to us a character and selfless love in a way that speaks to our deepest senses of how we all should be. It's the realization that life is bigger than me. That to concern my days, myself in my days with only myself, is the ultimate waste, the ultimate um, uh, uh, misuse of those things that have been entrusted to us. 
namely life, gifts that we've been given, opportunities that we've been given. This whole thing that we've been given, it's bigger than you and I. Life is bigger than us. And the way of Jesus calls us not to live for ourselves, for our own peace and security, but for him. Not thinking of ourselves, but of the next generation and the one after that. I dare you to find a blessing in the Bible that doesn't also say, and for your children and their children and their children. Go looking for it. There might be one or two, but the vast amount of blessings, promises, promised to the people of God had to do with generations. The whole mindset of scripture is thinking past our todays and thinking beyond our own lives and into the lives of those that will come after us. An inheritance is something you receive and you have little, you can't do much about that. Some of the inheritances that we've received could be good. Some of them can be bad. We have nothing, we can't control the things that have been passed down to us. But a legacy is something that we leave behind. A legacy, our legacy becomes someone else's inheritance. It's, uh, and in this moment right now, we're living between our inheritance and our legacy. So you have the opportunity now to plant trees. Not so that people would remember you. Not so they would walk by that tree and and that your motivation would be, oh, I want people to walk by that tree and I want them to see my name on it. I want to, I want, that's, that's the Chris Green tree. I like that tree. I let, so let me plant trees so that people see how that great Chris Green tree. No, my people might do that for me, for you. They might say, oh, this tree is planted in honor of, but that cannot be our motivations. As far as that, as it concerns us, plant trees. I'm speaking metaphorically. (laughs) You can go out and plant literal trees as well. That's a good thing. Plant trees. And do it so that the coming generations will have shade to take refuge in from the sun. So that they'll have fruit to nourish them when they are hungry. Branches to climb so that they can see the world from a higher point of view. This idea of planting trees reaches deep into our motivations and our trust in God and what he's doing in our world. There's a song that I want to play for you. It's written by a guy named Andrew Peterson. Um, It's called, as you might guess, Planting Trees. Um, I'm going to close my sermon with this song because um, it captures the whole whole message. But there's specifically lyrics in the bridge that I want to draw your attention to. Peterson says this, So sit down and write that letter. Sign up and join the fight. Sink into all that matters. Step out into the light. Let go of all that's passing. Lift up the least of these. Lean into something lasting, planting trees.